On October the 21st, at 8.40, Endeavour once again rounded the headland and made for the harbour of Whitby. The crowds again turned out in their thousands, and a small flotilla waited in the harbour to welcome the Endeavour. What an entrance, amid cannon fire, the magnificent sight of the replica H.M. Bark Endeavour entered the harbour, returning to its spiritual home of Whitby over 200 years after the original Endeavour, then known as the Earl of Pembroke, left. The original, built as a collier at Whitby in 1764 by Thomas Fishburne, was later sold to the Admiralty in 1768 and renamed the H.M. Bark Endeavour. It was in this ship that Captain Cook charted New Zealand and parts of Australia. His choice of ship was indeed fortunate, for having run aground on the Barrier Reef, a less sturdily built vessel would probably not have survived. The replica Endeavour was built in Fremantle, Australia between 1988 and 1993. Her sea trials took place in 1994. Now, after sailing halfway around the world, she's returned to Whitby. What a reception she received. Between May and October, she visited 12 other ports around the UK and two ports on the continent. But with a long Atlantic trip to America planned, a refit was going to be necessary. And as a result of the reception she'd received in Whitby, it was decided to do the refit there. People filled the streets and covered the cliff tops, truly a wonderful reception.
As Endeavour slipped in amongst the houses, these men were probably seeing Whitby in a way no one has seen her for over a hundred years. Endeavour berths at the same key as before, only this time there's a large marquee erected for the refit. Endeavour is berthed only a hundred yards from the house where Captain Cook started his seafaring apprenticeship with Quaker James Walker. In the late 19th century, Whitby had a pioneering photographer called Frank Sutcliffe, who in 1895 took this photograph through the station archway. 102 years later, the Endeavour offers a similar photo opportunity. With the music and costumes of Mora and Trish and the backdrop of the Endeavour, a real atmosphere began to develop. On the 27th of October, and with the onset of darkness, the crew makes a start removing the tons of stores below decks in preparation for the imminent refit. Eight o'clock Monday morning, and Jeff, the ship's first mate, briefs the assembled volunteers and introduces them to the crew. Refit is program. The program for the refit ceases running through to December 11th. That's 46 days. We could do it a lot quicker if we get decent weather, but um, just looking at what's happening today, it's like uh, it's starting uh, just as it needs to continue, perhaps. Having received their briefing, the volunteers were split into working parties and made a start on this mammoth task. This smaller anchor, hanging off what's called the cat head, is called a stream. During the refit, the crew will have to sleep ashore, so all the bedding, as well as general stores, must be removed. At last, it stopped raining. At the stern end, preparations to remove the gaff yard and sail are already underway. The ship's four-pound cannons will also be taken off, their lashings are removed in preparation. With the gaff rig at deck level, all the rigging can now be removed. The parrels can now be seen. These hold the spar onto the mast, but allow the spar to rotate freely. All the ropes must be labelled before being stored. This will prevent chaos raining on the re-rig. The first anchor to be lifted is the port stream. Ben attaches the lifting straps and the crane takes the weight.
Once the weight has been taken off the lashings, they can be removed and the anchor lifted onto the key. The marquee we saw earlier will be used as the sail loft and the first spar is already in there minus its sail. The next anchor to be removed will be the port bower anchor. With most of its lashings already removed, the straps are fitted and the weight taken up. The final lashings are removed and the anchor swings free and is placed next to the first on the key. Its size can clearly be seen against the volunteer. The gaff spar has had its sail unbent and will soon be moved to the shed where all the spars and blocks will be sanded and revarnished. The jaws at the end of the spar are lined with leather smeared with tallow to prevent chafing and wear against the mast. and still the stores come up from down below. The Spritzel topsail yard was removed earlier, its sail already unbent, and the crew are now removing its running rigging. Having been on the spar for nearly a year, it's a little reluctant to come off, but gentle persuasion by the crew soon resolves the problem. The yard will be removed to the other side to be rubbed down and varnished. Keep it all together. Oh, the fish bit. Right. Then write gaff on the side of it. Oh, 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 that one can really stay on it. Too easy. The mizzen gaff spar has also to go to the other shed, and both will be taken through the tower together. As the yards are walked through the town, the remaining spritzel yard has been prepared for removal. The crane driver, Gowan, checks to see that all is ready, and gently lowers the hook to receive the straps. The spars, meanwhile, are crossing Whitby's swing bridge. The strategy for removing the spritzel yard is discussed and put into action. The spar's weight is to be taken up with the two ropes called braces on the ends of the yards. Once this has been done, the spritzel yard slings that attach the yard to the mast can be removed and the yard freed. Easily said, but the reality requires some aerial gymnastics by the riggers. This work makes for hungry people, and though there are two ladies preparing the lunch today, there's a rotor which will share the job out over the refit. The final remnants of the spritzel yard slings are removed. The braces are slowly released, and the crane takes the full weight of the yard. The ropes going through the braces, called lifts, are removed, and the yard is removed onto the key.
The afternoon saw a welcome change in the weather that was to last more or less for the rest of the week. Cold but brilliant sunshine. And the preparation for the removal of the forecourse sail. The forecourse yard is attached to the mast by the jeer blocks seen here. Again, the spar is held onto the mast with parrels, which are not visible on this shot. On deck, the swivel guns are being removed. Small as they may seem, they still require two men to lift them off their stanchions. With all the weight of kit taken off so far, the waterline has risen some two to three inches. The main topsail yard has been lowered on its tie blocks and the yard is being prepared for removal. The forecourse yard is now nearly ready to be removed. First, the yard is hooked up to the crane, which will take up the weight of the yard. Well, that's the theory. In reality, the strops were too short and have to be repositioned. Once repositioned, the removal can begin. Again, the weight has been taken on the lift blocks and the yard can be lowered using lift sheets from the deck. A manoeuvre that requires skill and patience. But at this time of year, with sunset around 3.30, the light is rapidly failing, and with it the ability of the camera to provide pictures. First light shows preparations to remove the Tuggallant sail well underway. And the forecourse yard on the dockside, the crew having removed it almost under cover of darkness. A closer inspection shows some of the damage that needs attention. It also gives a better feel for the size of the jeer block that holds the yard. The second light coloured yards on top are called the studding sail yards. These can be extended out from the main spar for extra sail area in lighter winds. With the four to gallon sail on the deck, it can be moved to the quay where the sail will be removed from the yard, or to use the correct nautical term, the sail will be unbent. In the sail loft, two posts are fitted. These will allow the new ropes to be stretched before being used. On the ship, the mizzen topsail has been unbent and the yard is being removed onto the quay. In the sail loft, Glen, the ship's bosun, lays out the rope that will be used to replace the gammoning at the front of the ship. And as the stores and rigging continue to be removed, so the ship rides higher in the water. Now it's around three to four inches. Aloft, despite initial resistance, the removal of the four to gallant mast is well underway. The standing rigging is removed prior to the mast being dropped through the fore topmast cap. As with any working ship, bits get broken and bent. Here Samantha is preparing a wooden insert that will form the repair of a handrail. With all its rigging clear, the fore to gallant mast is dropped down onto the deck. The method used to lower the mast can be seen here.
Although it's nice and sunny and mid-afternoon, ice can still be seen on the quay as the crane is repositioned, ready to remove the fore topsail yard. The fore topsail yard is supported by the main support tie blocks. These blocks perform the same task as the jeer blocks on the course sails. Once the weight of the yards has been taken up by the crane, the order is given to remove the remaining rigging so the yard can be removed to the quay. As Tina and colleagues start to remove the lift sheet, Ben and colleague can be seen de-rigging the topgallant mast behind, all working around 150 feet above the deck. The manila rope we saw the bosun rigging in the sail loft, having been stretched, is now being tarred. The tar is used to protect the ropes from the elements, whilst leaving them flexible. A mucky job, but someone has to do it. The hull is also undergoing preparation, ready to be painted and varnished. With all the rigging cleared, the fore topsail yard can now be swung free and put down on the quay, ready for the sail to be unbent. These are the parrels that secure the yard to the mast. These smaller parrels show the basic construction. Parrels are made up from trucks and ribs. The trucks are cylindrical barrels with a hole through and the ribs keep the truck in place. Being laced together with a marlin, the trucks can spin on the rope a bit like a ball bearing. As the topgallant mast is lowered, a crew member guides it past the topsail. Up above, the top of the mast and lightning conductor are guided through the top mast cap. This picture shows the working of the running loop used to keep the mast from falling away as it passes out of the top mast cap. With the topsail yard being supported by the lift blocks at the ends of the yard, the topmast lifting strop can be removed. The protection sheath where the rope goes through the tie blocks can be seen as it's pulled through the mast head tie block. The lifting strops are hooked up to the crane whose jib is within feet of the rigging. With the strops all connected, the riggers are ordered away from the yard as the crane takes up the weight. Once the weight has been taken up, they can now remove the remaining rigging. The housings for the topgallant mast can be clearly seen in the top mast cap. With all the rigging now removed, the main topsail yard can be removed. No mean task for the crane driver with all the standing rigging still in place. Clear of the ship's rigging, the main topsail yard is lowered onto the quay, ready for the sail to be unbent and the remaining rigging on the yard to be removed.
Coupled with the fact that the rigging has been in place for years and the still freezing conditions, it makes it a difficult task. The gammoning rope in the sail loft is receiving its second coat of tar. The fore topmast is next to be removed. Before this can be lifted though, there's a locking pin to be removed in the mainmast cap. As Ben is demonstrating, it's so simple you can do it laying down. Planking on the hull is held in place with pegs. Each of the pegs has the name of an Australian school child written into it. Samantha, who we saw earlier, is now about to repair the damaged handrail using the wooden block we saw her making earlier. The correct technical term for this sort of repair is bogging. A black adhesive is first put into the hole and the new piece of wood is taped into place. It's left proud so it can be finished flush with the existing rail later. The insert is clamped into place. She puts cling film between the wood and the jaws of the clamp to prevent any adhesive sticking the clamp to the wood. Because there's a possibility of a clamp being knocked off, they must be tied on with a lashing. That's as far as Samantha can go until the adhesive has dried. Working beside her on the fore channel is one of the volunteers who's removing the foremast backstay. Below decks and an area definitely not found on the original endeavour is the engine room. This is Wally's domain, who we find replacing a sacrificial anode. Yeah. Danny the shipwright is working on the hull. He is repairing the sections of hull that have been damaged using a catalyst filler. But first he must make sure all the damaged wood has been removed, giving the filler a good sound surface to bond to. As the sun begins to sink, the four topmast shrouds are still being de-rigged. Tide is rising, putting the ship high in the water, making it impossible for the crane to get sufficient height to lift off the four topmast today. It'll have to wait until tomorrow. Day three and the four topmast still in place. The crew is clearing the ice from the quay ready for the mast. A raft is used to work around the hull. As can be seen, much work has already been done. The large yards must be removed from the quay to make space for the masts. The rigging and quay now clear, removal of the top masts can now begin. The straps are placed around the four topmast trestle trees and hooked up to the crane. These guys, remember, are working over 100 feet off the deck. Once the straps are secured, the shrouds can be removed on the fighting top. The Arctic leaves with the yards, and the decks are cleared ready for the mast to be removed. As the fore top mast is gently lifted, a rigger has to undo the lighting connection between the two masts with a little support from his friends, of course. With the conductor free and everything clear, Ben checks if his nails are broken and the technical signal for all clear lift away is given. The mast is eased away from the platform and lowered onto the quay. At this point, the riggers pause briefly to take holiday snaps and then it's back to work. 
The foretop mast is checked over by the bosun, who makes a note of what repairs are required. The de-rigging of the mast is already underway. The topmast cap has already been removed, as has parts of the standing rigging. The ropes on these parts are not tarred in the same way as the running rigging. Riggers black is used. With the removal of the trestle tree, the shroud tops can be seen. Ben explains the dust is from a sandstorm the Endeavour encountered during its passage to England. This part of the shroud doesn't really get much exposure and the dust has got right in there. To prevent moisture and rain getting into the now exposed hollow foremast, a plastic cover is placed over the top of the mast. With its rigging removed, the fore top mast is now ready to be sanded down and varnished. It can also be seen the weather has taken a turn for the worst. But this can in no way be allowed to delay the work. Waterproofs donned, the de-rig of the top mast now begins. Already Tina and Ben are up on the trestle tops fitting the straps and Gowan swings the crane in ready to couple up. Once the crane has been coupled, the shards can be cut away. The crowd standing on the quay opposite can hardly believe what they're witnessing. Unlike the foremast, this one proved a little more reluctant to let go, the crane putting more and more pressure on the mast until finally out it popped. The crane driver later confirmed that over three tons of lift was applied before the mast came away. Easing the mast gently up, the crew check everything is clear, swinging the radar out of the way, the mast is lifted clear and onto the quay, ready for its standing rigging to be removed. With both top masts loaded and away, the crane is then used to lift off the port bower anchor. Weighing in at around the ton, it's no real surprise that the painting crew have moved their raft out of the way and are keeping a wary eye on the proceedings going on above their heads. With all the lashing removed, the anchor is lifted off and onto the quay. The next to follow the anchor was the ship's four-pound cannons, four of them in all. About halfway along the ship, resting under the mainmast shrouds, is a small kedge anchor. Small as it may be in comparison to the bower or stream, it's still heavy enough to demand respect from the crew, who put a restraining line prior to it being lifted off. Both the foremast preventer stay and the foremast stays were scheduled for removal, and as the riggers began to remove them, Glenn the bosun checked the tension on a steel line rigged to take the place of the stays. And still the volunteers on the raft continued to sand down the hull. In the loft, having completed the tarring of the gammoning rope, a start has been made on the anchor warp. Because of the way the warp is constructed, this is even more difficult than the gammoning rope. Removing the gammoning proved a little more difficult than originally thought, and it was the next morning before most of it had been removed. Tina is removing some of the standing rigging from the ship, although I suspect she may think it's the invisible dog. She needs a holiday. In the shed on the East Quay, all the spars and masts can be found. 
Work is already underway on sanding down the block on one of the spars. Plenty to go. Danny, on the other hand, is hard at work on one of the forward hatches. So what is it exactly you're doing? Uh, Regasketing the ports. It's the gasketing that, uh, that keeps the water out. And, uh, just redoing it. Make sure they're nice and tight so the water gets in. In the sail loft, Tanya receives her first lesson in splicing rope. This block has been re-varnished and is now having a coat of rigorous black applied. This is a mixture of tar, varnish and black paint and unlike tar will set hard. Not all the ropes to be spliced are big ones. With the sail loft a hive of activity, here Tanya is, in the words of Tina, bashing the hell out of it. All the major items off, the ship's guides can prepare for the visitors. By the beginning of December, the hull's paintwork now looks immaculate, the rudder pendants clearly visible. In the first snow of the year, the four-course main yard is having its sail bent on. A difficult job in these temperatures, but it has to be put on correctly, so considerable effort in getting it right is used. The anchors have also been returned to the ship. All that needs to be done now is to put the yards into place. There is, however, one new item to be seen on the stern, a global communications antenna necessary for the Atlantic crossing to America. With work continuing on the four-course yard, the last cannon is lifted back aboard. The snow on deck looks quite attractive, even if it makes the decks a little bit slippery. The lashings for the starboard bower anchor are completed. I think there's mischief afoot here. Yes, I was right. Australians do have a strange way of removing snow from the back of their necks. Time for a quick cup of tea to warm up those cold hands and back to work. Tea over and preparations are underway to lift the main topsail yard. Carefully eased into place, re-rigging now begins. The lifts are rigged and Ben passes the large tie lines through the tie block. the ends of which are then taken up the mast to be tied off at the trestle tree. This shot at the fighting top clearly shows the seating of the top mast. Snow is great until it starts to melt. Glenn pulls up the main tops on lift lines. The line that was attached to the end of the yard to help control it during its replacement on the ship can now be removed. The fore topsail is next to be placed on the ship and much the same procedure is followed as the previous yard.
The four-core sail, still on the quay, now has its studding sail booms fitted. Finally, the four-course yard is lifted onto the ship. It's intended that the yard will be lifted into place using the lift sheets so the yard has been rested on top of the timber heads. Down port side. All that remains now is for the small topgallant masts and yards to be lifted into place. This will be done by hand in the same way as they were removed. She'll sail for Hull and Dry Dock on December the 12th. We wish the Endeavour and all who sail in her good luck and best wishes in her travels.